patient with severe asthma has been seen by their family physician and a diagnosis of thoracic outlet syndrome has been made because of the narrowing of the scaling gap. What's the most likely symptom of this syndrome causing the initial consultation? There are different types of entrapment in the scaling triangle leading to um, a thoracic outlet syndrome. And the brachial plexus is often involved in the neurogenic type. And uh, there would be probably upper limb issues that would be the precipitating event getting them to see consultation. My name is Dr. Justin Brown at the University of California at San Diego in the Division of Neurosurgery. I am a uh, peripheral nerve specialist in the division, and today I want to discuss uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, and specifically neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. Thoracic outlet syndrome, or TOS as we refer to it, is a pain syndrome uh, generally involving the upper extremities. Most commonly when a patient presents with these symptoms, people think of a cervical rib, which we evaluate for with a chest x-ray, but the cervical rib uh, syndrome is probably one of the rarer forms of neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. We encounter the majority of the patients who present with these pains and symptoms uh, come with a particular posture, a shoulder forward, uh, hunched posture that seems to be exacerbated by a particular work situation. Uh, diagnosing thoracic outlet syndrome can be uh, very puzzling because there are a number of pain sources in the syndrome. There's pains from the muscle imbalance that have contributed to this posture. This can be pains through the upper back, through the neck. And then there are the pains related to the neuritis or the uh, irritated nerves that occur in the neck, but it can also be contributed to by uh, compression at the uh, neural foramen and the cervical spine, at the cubital tunnel, at the carpal tunnel. And it tends to be a continuum of nerve compressions throughout the upper extremity. When addressing these entities, it's important to establish what the cause of the disorder is. If this was from an acute trauma, such as a whiplash injury or an obstetrical brachial plexus palsy, often there's scar tissue buildup, and this will need to be addressed surgically. Nonetheless, the patient should be addressed by a physical therapist first. We need to see if the postural uh, problems can be corrected, if we can bring the shoulders back into the proper position, stretch the scalene muscles, eliminate some of the contributing uh, postures and positions the patients are assuming throughout the day that are exacerbating the situation. And I would say the vast majority of our patients are able to be uh, significantly alleviated or even cured by uh, proper physical therapy. But when the patient comes in with this, this set of symptoms, our primary uh, means of making a diagnosis is not EMG or electrodiagnostic studies, but instead the physical exam. Now the reason for this is the nerve pain of thoracic outlet syndrome is primarily a neuritis and that is a nerve inflammation. It's an irritation of the nerve that occurs dynamically when the nerve is being compressed, and it often does not result in axon loss or reduced conduction or things that are obvious on the EMG studies. But one of the pathognomonic features of TOS is that when the patient raises their arms in the air for any period of time, they immediately elicit the symptoms. They have excruciating pain in the neck and radiating it into the arms, and this is alleviated by putting the arms back down at the side. As well, we go through um, examination of each of the entrapment points, compressing the wrist over the carpal tunnel, the elbow over the cubital tunnel, and then placing pressure over the thoracic outlet itself, and then attempting the Sperling's maneuver by closing the neural foramen. And the site at which the majority of the pain is elicited is usually the primary source. So putting pressure, placing the thumb over the scalene muscles and applying some pressure usually causes a complete recreation of the symptoms down into the extremity. So a patient then is referred to physical therapy, and uh, they go through a number of exercises, both to stretch the scalenes, nerve mobilization exercises to uh, mobilize the nerves through the carpal and cubital tunnels. Um, we, if there is a, a significant component of uh, ulnar neuritis, we place them in elbow pads and uh, teach them to, to sleep with their arms straight to alleviate this. But if after significant uh, therapy, the patient's symptoms either persist or worsen, we will then proceed to surgery. Surgery, uh, for the most part, um, 
is focused on the, the primary source of the symptoms. Now, sometimes a patient with thoracic outlet syndrome will also have a significant contribution from the ulnar nerve at the elbow. If this is the case, we will often decompress the ulnar nerve alone and then refer the patient back to therapy, and we have success with this. At times, the thoracic outlet itself is 90% of the symptoms, in which case that will need to be decompressed directly. We find that decompressions of the thoracic outlet generally involves resecting the scalene muscles in the neck. Uh, while many centers feel that it's important to remove the first rib, if this rib is not anatomically abnormal, we think it's important to leave the rib in place. It reduces the morbidity of the procedure, the post-operative pain, and uh, lengthens the recovery time um, if the rib is removed. Therefore, we make a small incision right uh, in line with the clavicle. We dissect, uh, preserving the supraclavicular nerves. We lift the fat pad out of the way, find the scalene muscles themselves, and then we transect them with a bipolar electrocautery. Uh, at the end of this procedure, we're able to see that the nerves themselves are free. There's no compression on them. We then close, inject local lidocaine, and the patient stays overnight and is discharged the next day.